start by asking each of our panelists to just um, give me from their own, both business and association perspectives, their comments on what the most salient findings are and what it means to your business and to your associations. Okay, want to start, Steve? Um, well, I think obviously the findings show that there's huge uh, possibilities of growth within within youth travel uh, and the emerging markets, not only as a uh, receiver of emerging markets and accommodation, but also looking at emerging markets to put our Western skills or develop skills into emerging markets to actually grow our, our business. It's, it's very interesting. For the members of the association, it obviously shows that they, uh, with this data, they, they should be uh, making sure that they're accessible to developing markets in terms of their marketing um, and also potentially looking at um, potentially looking at um, emerging markets as places to grow their business as well. And to grow their memberships, I take it. It's all about memberships. <laughs> okay. From a personal point of view, in your business, you are a London-based um, hotel and hostel, okay? And marketing company. How are you, if you don't mind sharing with us, changing your business to make sure that you are also focused on emerging markets as well as London, which is clearly a developed one. Um, we have a hotel in Moscow, and, and that in itself um, is through a franchise model where they wanted the, the Western skills in there, as it were. Uh, it has cultural challenges, and, and it's a different way of working. But there's huge opportunities there. Um, in terms of the marketing side, um, the emerging markets probably have better quality internet, have uh, more savviness generally in regards to the online space. We have clients in Bali, in Ghana, um, in St. Petersburg, and it, it all comes through the websites. So it's, they're, they're very savvy, they're very online. I did a, a, a skills exchange in Cambodia last year, um, and there was free Wi-Fi everywhere. Whereas you go around Berlin and there isn't any. So the whole online space for people's business, it's so important because they're there, they're, the growth in, in smartphones you know, it's big in Europe, but it's huge in developing countries, so, um, and developing markets, so yeah, that's, that's all. Uh, Nick, as your perspective from Itoa, what is the interest and the impact of youth travel, and are you really in the space or not? Well, very much in this space, uh, both physically but also metaphorically speaking, um, because our association represents so many different types of, uh, of travel companies, of tour operators. We have members who are specifically working in the education and travel sector. We have members who are, I know they don't like the phrase, but bed banks, online accommodation providers, uh, who are obviously interested in this sector. We have members who work more with the adult groups, but the thing that's interesting that was said in the presentation is I know personally, from my own background, that the student travel industry, the youth travel industry, the education travel industry, might come back to all this terminology because I've got a few queries about that, um, provides so much to the industry, not just in terms of providing the future travellers. So you travel with your school today, you travel with your university tomorrow, you travel with your family later on, with a group, however you decide to travel in the future. So it keeps the industry going that way. But actually, interestingly, from, uh, from our perspective as well, we notice that a lot of the really bright people, and I'm not saying that because that's my background, but that, that come into the travel industry often come through the student travel industry as well. So One of the things that has been mentioned here is that the size of the market defies its identification as a niche. So my question is, Samuel, how has a $175 billion industry managed to stay below the radar until now, and what's different now, what's new, that has brought the focus of global brands and of government? From my point of view, it seems very simple. Uh, you have no data, you have no industry. So only if you measure something, then you have an argument, you have a number, and you, you, you can tell a story. And there were only few brands or few companies or institutions that were able to draw some conclusions what's going on in the whole 
fact that the youth struggle exists and that it's so huge and do some moves towards uh, youth struggle. But now it becomes a public knowledge and will attract more and more governments, government agencies, international organizations, individual brands. Makes sense, thanks. Um, a question addressing that then, if there is now so much focus on this industry because it's so large and there are so much shifts and government in all developed countries are erecting barriers to this industry, how can industry, how can associations fight this erection of barriers and do something in order to free up the flow of students and the mobility? And you both sit on, on associations, so go ahead. In Britain, uh, get rid of all the politicians. Um, but no, uh, in, in the UK, we did a, a, a UK study to get the value of uh, youth tourism um, to the British economy, and it was, you know, it's a billion dollar industry. Um, and it's very, very difficult. I mean, the UK, they really, um, from a governmental point of view, I, I'm not a politician, I don't have politics, uh, it is, it, they don't really recognise it. And, you know, even, uh, I remember going to an event about seven years ago, the Minister of Tour Tourism talked about youth travel in regards to her amazing youth travel experience of going to a uh, campsite in Bognor. Uh, and she was stood next to a guy who set up a volunteering programme to, to Ghana. So they just don't have, understand the actual scope of, of the industry. And the, the barriers and the visa situation in the UK really does affect it. And I think it's a huge opportunity for developing countries without those barriers because you know, if you have to, as in, as in Russia, um, wait for a week to know if you can travel to the UK or not, you'll choose somewhere else because it's, it's immediate. So I think the industry have got to work together to keep banging on the drum, to keep telling people, look, this is a huge industry and by doing um, short-sighted political changes to visa structures, you can actually affect the whole economy in a huge way. So you see associations having a role in producing research that drives that agenda. What about you? Uh, well, you, you've said my magic word there, visas. Um, anybody that knows me knows that I've become, in the last two years, completely obsessed by visas. And I have lots of uh, meetings with governments and the European Commission and so forth. Um, actually, we're trying really hard this year as an association to highlight the problems of visas because the general population at large, and let's not forget it's also important to remind populations of the importance of education and travel, not just outbound from their country, so that, you know their, 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 their youth can travel, but also people from abroad coming into their country and providing, let's not forget, also the, uh, the, the investment in the tourism sense. Uh, the barrier side with visas is really, really in danger of making all these lovely figures uh, be a lot flatter. Uh, simply because, although it's not the only structural difficulty, the visa situation at the moment is losing a lot of money. And the reason why you said when you talk to governments is you always have two conversations. You have one conversation with the business, enterprise, tourism industries who say, we love youth travel. Wow, fantastic. That sounds great. All these people, brilliant. You then go and have the same conversation with the Home Affairs Security Borders people uh, and it's like watching the TV, as in they seem to be listening and there's nice words coming out, but you can't interact with the TV, you just sit there and watch it. It's a little bit like that and, and they, they are not interested in anything other than securing borders. So unfortunately, we've seen it in the UK uh, because completely understandably there was concern about bogus institutions for studying, suddenly the whole of the educational travel, the study travel industry, I think I'm right in saying this, has been clamped down on. Uh, and, and so we're suffering as an industry, as an educational travel industry, because they're not people having a bigger picture. You know? You're suggesting, Nick, that these barriers with visas is going to depress the rising tide. I'd like Samuel to answer whether or not he thinks that's the case. Are we going to see the numbers go down? 
or so, oh, sorry, can I have something say, else to say? No, sorry. No, 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 no. If it stays as it is in some cases, because we just don't have the structures in place. If the growth comes from India, that, that middle class that you showed us, if that comes from India, from China, new places, and we don't at least reform our visa system in Schengen and in the UK, then the danger is the growth will not be realised, even though it's potentially there, because there's structural barriers in place. I don't think so, but I think that uh, visas will always be an issue because uh, from the researcher point of view, as we say, that visa are a tool of fear. And, uh, or a tool of? Fear. Fear, okay. Uh, basically, when uh, there is a new emerging country, then uh, there is new natural demand. And uh, we have to deal with that somehow, okay? And the easiest way is to ban something. The, the, that's the one solution. The other one is let everybody in. Impossible, of course. So therefore, you need to develop some strategic approach, some policies, some regulations, and that's not easy to do. So I think that uh, there should be more collective effort, as uh, it has been mentioned, that, uh, for example, to uh, seize the market to have a voice and a, uh, and a strong voice to governments and then uh, um, probably in addition to that to offer some cooperation or solution to, to policies and standards because this is what uh, they have difficulties to do I guess <laughs> it won't make it their life easier so. I guess I'd like to ask uh, whether anyone on the panel or the audience um, would echo my thoughts that while visas erect barriers to specific countries, they do nothing to dampen demand globally. And that depressed capacity in certain destinations will lead not just the demand to seek other destinations, but will lead the business community in that country to reach out into other destinations and develop opportunities there, like in Russia. Okay, so what are your thoughts about that? As I said, uh, we've noticed, particularly in the past 18 months, uh, with the hotel in Moscow, that there's been a huge increase in actual Russian, uh, young Russians traveling to Moscow to visit Moscow and traveling around. And I guess it's a bit like um, in the UK 100 years ago when the YHA was created, it was for getting young people traveling around the UK, and then, then they started traveling internationally. That's what I believe is, sort of, is happening in Russia, particularly. Um, and yeah, the opportunity is there, not just in Moscow, St. Petersburg, but you know, uh, Russia's got seven or eight, I think, time zones. It's a very big country, and there's a huge opportunity to travel within that country as well. So, you know, um, there, there, are, there are definitely opportunities, and it does. If they, if they can't go, they want to travel and they can't go to England or go to Europe, they'll go somewhere. Uh, so it pre presents opportunities for different destinations. It seems that uh, the visa issues do not harm the overall student demand to travel internationally. They just rule in different ways. So if if uh, if the student wants to go abroad and they cannot to go to destination of their first choice, they go somewhere else. That's what is happening. And, and the the second question after that is if you are seeing a diversion of traffic, do you then also see a diversion of program development and businesses outside your country, in those countries where you have reduced access? Is that happening? Do you see it happening in your membership? Well, yes. I mean, our association is, is there for tourism in Europe. So the reason why what Samus is totally correct, what's interesting is it doesn't dampen demand when you put up these barriers, it displaces where the destinations they go to. Now obviously for someone like me representing an association which is to do with tourism in Europe, so our members, uh, especially someone like the UK, they're, they're not going to like that, uh, that, that, you know, that, that scenario because that means they're ultimately going to miss out on some of this. But absolutely, you, you see it anywhere you look around the world. Okay, moving along, one of the other questions that I'd like to raise is the entire issue of meaningful travel. If what characterizes youth travel is meaningful travel, how do you reconcile that, first of all, with these huge numbers, and second of all, 
with the kind of um, move towards mainstream travel interest, can these numbers sustain meaningful travel and can mainstream operators who are moving into the space provide it? Who wants to answer that one? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, actually, I'm interested because Samuel in his uh, presentation talked about meaningful travel and then talked at one point about educational travel. And it strikes me that some of this is terminology. My own personal travel industry background is working for an educational travel company. Now, they were doing trips, okay? But these trips were organized in such a way that the students got as much as possible with their high school teacher groups as they could out of the trip. Of course, they did the standard sightseeing in Paris with a view of the Eiffel Tower and so forth. But added into these programs were things like cooking classes, uh, interaction with their guides, that whole area is, is a huge one of possibilities there. At that point, I would say, I've worked as a guide myself for many years with young groups, when they get to the end, have they had an educational travel experience? Absolutely, 100%. Would some people seeing that school group traveling around think it's just a bunch of kids enjoying themselves, which of course they do, and they, and they, they learn in so many other ways simply than traveling to the destinations they learn about themselves, they learn about back home. You know, the, the, there's a never-ending series of great experiences they can have from it on all levels. But have they had an educational travel experience? Yes. Would some people looking at those school groups, perhaps who didn't know the industry, think, oh look, it's a bunch of kids making a bit of noise for the school? Yes as well sometimes. So actually the elephant in the room sometimes is that youth travel, but maybe that's why people are paying attention now, youth travel has sometimes in the past had a bit of a, of a, a not a negative, but a certain image attached to it by people who aren't involved in it. Um, so, so, so that I, I already pick up on the meaningful travel. In a way, all travel is meaningful. It's just to what degree it's meaningful. Can I ask Samuel to just comment on what um, what the figures are or what the status is of school group travel within the sectors that are explored? Is there as much data on that as on other sectors? Let me start with the reaction of Nick. <clears throat> uh, it's not uh, how we or anybody categorize these travelers, but how do they themselves counsel. So these, those two graphs were about surveys, when uh, in one case 8,500 uh, uh, students or young travelers were uh, surveyed, and uh, in other cases as well it was an end customer survey. So uh, it's how they counsel themselves, whether it is uh, leisure or it is visiting friends or it is uh, or business or meaningful travel etc. So th that's important perspective. Well, I, just wanna, I just wanted to add that leisure travel can have a lot of meaning to it as well. Because they would probably say leisure travel because they're on holiday, maybe with their school or on a trip, but they're still learning things. That's, that's, I, I was just picking up on the, the, the sort of... Like that's the where I'm heading. That, uh, like, and from the researcher point of view, I have also always say the methodology, how it comes to reality and therefore if they judge themselves, even though they have notes and etc., so what should they say, it's, it's always up to them. That's first. And second, uh, you know, to make long story short, it seems like, I agree with you that uh, it, it is not like whether it is or it is not a meaningful travel, but to what degree, because all travel is sort of giving you something. Uh, but basically, in news travel, meaningful travel means that it's not just fun. So everything outside fun or leisure only. So all these trips you mentioned, all the school, uh, school groups, these are all calculated as meaningful travel. That's what I wanted to know. But before we go on, I'd just like to see if there are any questions from the audience, if there are any um, issues you would like to raise, if there were any of the points made that you would like to challenge or question? Any of the figures? What a docile crowd. I have, a, I have someone with a question. I don't think we have a microphone down there, so I'm just going to give this to you. Hello, uh, this is Jeff LeBan from Seattle, Center for International Career Development. Uh, J1 sponsor in the USA. Uh, I forgot your name on the right. Your left. Ed? Nick. Nick. Nick, yeah, hey, Nick. Um, what have been your most effective uh, strategies 
what have been your most effective strategies in uh, battling the government uh, or working with them, as the case may be, to get reasonable, intelligent uh, policies in place? Or are you currently reeling from the recent attack on reason in the UK? Sorry, specifically in the UK or just in general? Well, your, your, your visa, uh, you were mentioning that they've changed the policies there to, to make it very difficult for people to arrive in the, in the UK on these youth work and travel, working holiday types of visas. What, is, what are effective strategies to combat uh, that and maybe return it to a, a reasonable type of policy that allows that type of travel? In, in a way, I think what you have to do is you have to remind government, uh, if, if you have that conversation, as I said, directly with the people in charge of borders, they're the wrong people to be talking to. They're interested in efficiency. Are we doing a good job? Do we hit our performance targets? Now, you could question there whether they do as well. In regards of, of the student travel, I know that within the particular, I think you must be referring to for uh, people coming on study trips, uh, planning on doing an education or even youth work experience. I think the industry there, and I think this is what's great about Samuel's figures, uh, has tried really hard to highlight that the UK, especially in the current economic climate, would be doing itself a massive disservice to its economy if it makes things so tight that it loses out on the hugely important international student market. Not just those that come to our universities, which are highly regarded around the world, but the people that come to learn English, the people that come because they see the UK in particular as a great educational destination with a long history of welcoming international students. Now, it's true that you have to battle that size when you put figures onto something. When you say rather, listen, we do great out of, uh, of all the international students that come here and all the interest that they bring and the know-how, and it's great for our economy, the minute you start putting figures on it, then people sit up and listen. Nick, are you suggesting that one of the roles of an association on this issue is not just to address and lobby government, but to address and lobby the general public to gain support? Yes, I mean, if I can go slightly on a tangent, but not too much. Uh, we've run a lot of city tourism seminars, and something I always ask city tourist boards, is I said to a lot of them actually, uh, we have this big city fair in, in June every year in London, and I said to a lot of city tourist boards, what do you do to promote tourism and interact, and also ask your own populations where they have, uh, have challenges, shall we say, with the tourism, so that you have a dialogue with your own populations about tourism. Now, some cities actually, I know Paris is an example, go out and ask the populations about their image of tourism, what they think, etc., good and bad. And I think that's very important because I think there is a danger in Europe in particular. We have these cities that get lots of visitors and people just take the tourism for granted. And the local population, they see it with, as I said, they see a school group, they see a tour coach, and they don't think, great, these people are coming here, they're bringing their investment, their money, they create jobs and so forth. They think it's a big coach which is getting in the way of my car, or alternatively, it's a school group, oh, these kids, pesky kids. Seriously. So you're, you're talking about public information campaigns. I think it's that, and I think it's also the image as well, and I think we have to always work hard in the tourism industry to remind the greater public, people at large, politicians even, of the importance of the sector, the huge importance of the sector. You, one of your slides, Samuel, indicated that it isn't just increased government scrutiny that you've noticed, but there's increased association scrutiny. Have you seen, and I ask Steve as well because you're um, on the board of StayWise, which is a sector association of a larger association, do you see associations cooperating across um, national and international boundaries to apply pressure on this issue that affects them all, really? Yes. I uh, see uh, in some sectors because uh, I think it, it's directly connected to the size of the sector. So, for example, language travel, it's pretty mature, it's, it's a, it has a long history and uh, it has reached certain uh, level of value, maturity, competitiveness and uh, therefore they are forced to uh, put all the powers together and, and join, it jointly address governments uh, with some, some initiatives they do too collectively. 
So I think it's, it's directly connected to what's the pressure. And now uh, some sectors do that, in some sectors associations are not so developed like volunteering. So naturally there is nothing to put together in terms of associations and joint forces. Uh, so uh, yes they do. Uh, on the other hand, mostly it is only on local or national level. It is very rare, and I'm not saying it's not there in some sectors it is, it's very rare that uh, they put together all their forces internationally and uh, try to lobby uh, somewhere because it doesn't even make so, sense, so much sense. The only initiative I saw, thought to be discussed was that uh, why each country has different regulations for what are the good agents and what are not good agents, like Australia has special training for agencies or the UK, etc. So why not to launch a cross-country agent training that would be enough for all governments, but this is only an idea. Uh, this is the joint initiative internationally, I saw. I think with accommodation, it's, it's pretty stay-wise with representing accommodation. It's quite difficult because it's so different in every country in terms of lobbying. But what I guess we did was to do the study and get as much data as possible to, to arm the people in those countries who are members to have the data to go and help them try and push it and, and, and have figures, like you said before, figures to actually prove that what they're doing is a good thing for the economy or a good thing for their country. Um, the last study, I think it was 1,500 uh, hostel or accommodation providers worldwide. You know that's meaningful data, there's eight cities that have got average bed rates, because that's what a hotel companies have done for years because they've got all that data and I guess um, the association, although it's quite difficult to do global lobbying because it, it, you know, it's so difficult, if you can provide your members with information and data so they can either lobby themselves or at least have the confidence that um, there, is a, there is a positive story. So we're back to associations being a source of funding and um, assistance to their members to apply pressure. And bodies like UNWTO or, or the such supporting the same kind of activity together with associations. And again, public information. Okay. Um, does anyone in the audience have any other questions? No. I have one last question for the panel. Okay. We're here because we're all looking at youth travel and its growth. Do you see that? and the, the different developments in youth travel changing the characteristics of global tourism overall in the next 20 years. Will our student travelers today become travelers tomorrow and will they carry with them those behaviors and those characteristics and will they change the industry? Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, well, my obvious answer would be absolutely yes, only because the scientists inside me, not that I have a science background, but forensically looking at it, already I'm different from my parents' generation and they were different from their generation. And of course, you know, this is no secret, the internet is the big game changer. I also think um, what's very interesting is I think probably people are becoming more and more confident as travellers. Uh, interestingly, not in all the emerging markets. That's, that's, that's a big difference. So in, in so-called mature markets like the United States, uh, you will see young people who maybe 20, 30 years ago would have stuck with doing simply organized tours, some of them may strike out more and do slightly more what their parents' generation would see as adventurous things, and they'll use technology above all to achieve this. Um, in the emerging markets, initially, in China I know for a fact, and also in India, and in Brazil in fact as well, there's a tendency to travel more together, uh, but each of those markets has their own little, uh, little sides they call it. I, sort of, I echo that. I, mean, I think technology means that when uh young people travel now, there's a lot less in terms of surprises because you can see and almost feel and hear what that city's going to be like. What I, I, I believe is that because uh, technology now, my phone's ringing in my pocket, it's a prime example, you get so used to emailing and Facebooking that the actual people-to-people -people contact becomes heightened and I think people's demand for experiential travel will actually grow because um, it's basically, we're programmed and, you know, 
millions of years ago we were programmed to actually communicate with others uh, face to face, humans. Uh, I think that will actually grow uh, where people will, will strive and crave this something different, something their friends haven't done, which is perfect for each other. So um, I think technology will sort of aid that because people can get, you know, seeing a photo and then actually seeing a sunset over Angkor Wat, you prefer to go to Angkor Wat and see it yourself. So I think uh, that experience, I think, will be heightened. Samuel, I'm sure that you have something to, to comment on overall before we end the session. If you are asking whether uh, young travelers are uh, influenced or will influence the, the global tourism and or not, the answer is very simple. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, but how much? If the question is how much, then I'm thinking, or how, then, uh, you know, the, the, the pace, the tempo of uh, this tourism world, how it is changing, is so quick that I don't even dare to say how much or how exactly it will change. On the other hand, it seems to be pretty simple for me, like the better way, the, the best way to find the answer is to be involved in the industry. Because if you are there, uh, you are in contact with that industry that will form uh, the global tourism, then you are on the same side of the river. Good advice. Thanks very much, Sam. Thank you for all joining us and glad you're interested in the sector. Stay involved.